prepared. Let's let's start from the the obesity example and then maybe move into like the criminality stuff mm-hmm. because I think those have varying degrees of impact on society, both, you know, important conversations to have, but um let's take obesity for example. Mm-hmm. Um it, I don't think it's it's new information that it's a sort of a looming popu- uh, a looming um f- concern for mm-hmm. especially western societies. Um morbid obesity obesity is steadily rising and I don't remember the exact figures you quoted but um it is a, it is a problem that we we have to we have to <laughs> address um but I I think the the public consensus of this problem is is largely um on on individuals you know if I see someone who's who's relatively out of shape um I might make a judgment on them cast judgment about um their morality or their ability to control themselves or or make decisions um or just lack of self control as a whole and I, I look at them as sort of in an in a negative light but given all of uh, this understanding that we're now sort of drawing from from neuroscience and our understanding of the the genome there might be other factors at play there yeah and i think you know as the data um becomes unavoidable for policymakers you know they have to accept that obesity is a growing problem if you excuse the pun uh, it's costing the nhs and most healthcare systems you know a huge amount as is diabetes um and there is you know a genetic predisposition towards these types of behaviors so in which case actually what we need to do is make sure because there is still an environmental um kind of um there's an environmental push behind any type of decision making and so therefore what we need to do is make sure that the environment supports those people that are predisposed to have these vulnerabilities and that's the you know the main argument of the book so th- simple things like for example in the UK um the supermarkets here now no longer have the ability to have um sweeties and confectionery right at the aisle where you go and pay. So quite often you go shopping, you've got you know you've got your bits right. that you've got to go and get, you've made your list uh and then at the end perhaps you're like phew I've done all my shopping and so therefore um I'm you know I'm I'm going to cave in and I'm going to get this chocolate bar here, right. I'm going to get these crisps, I'm going to get all of this stuff. Actually just remove that temptation and make it easier for individuals that to is, make it's no longer healthier. Allowed. So that that's that no longer happens in UK supermarkets. Wow. Yeah. So you know, the simple things like that, and for example, making the choice between a chocolate biscuit and a piece of fruit um, economically easier. So, for example, if a banana or um, an apple was half the price of a chocolate bar, that would help people to make that decision towards going making it the best decision. Of course, of course. And if for example supermarkets were encouraged when people were doing their online shopping to kind of advertise the healthier choices rather than the unhealthy choices, again that would be a you know a fantastic policy I think. I think that that's su- that surprises me a lot. I didn't know that that was the case here because I was at the I've I've been to a couple markets while I've been been around um, in London and uh, and Cambridge and I, at the sort of at the cash there's there's like nuts and like yogurts and healthy options and i just thought oh this maybe this is what they prefer here no <laughs> no no <laughs> so it's quite a recent change so that is really interesting there's um uh so under david cameron's government which was maybe oh gosh i should know maybe about 10 years ago? Sure. Eight years ago? I I'm yeah. going to trust you on that. Okay, well, no, don't. I don't know. I, I should know off the top of my head, but I don't. It feels like it was 10 years ago, but who knows? Like, it's been strange time warp over the last fair few enough, years. Fair enough, fair enough. It's not 10 years ago. It's probably about five years ago. Jeez, where is the time? Yeah, anyway, so... Um, under his leadership, he set up the Behavioural Insights uh, team that was basically using findings from neuroscience and psychology to help influence people's decision-making. I think that's brilliant. I, I, th- I think that's a good example of science informing policy in, in a productive way for, for society because um, I think the extreme end of, uh, of sort of, um, what do you, like this biological determinism argument is that, um, are, are there just winners and losers effectively of like this genetic lot- lottery? Well, I don't think that's the case. No, I, no, 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 no. And if you look at the major, the huge majority of scientists and academics that are working in these types of field, they're incredibly liberal because you can see that there are biological constraints within mm-hmm. each of us. We each have our, you know, vulnerabilities or flaws, if you like. And, and on the flip side, we each have our strengths, right? So what we want to do as a society is help support people so that they make good decisions so that they're 
flaws or idiosyncrasies aren't kind of manipulated or exposed by the environment in a bad way and so support make support them in their decision making there without them consciously possibly consciously being aware and then just try and make the most out of the strengths that each individual can offer and that is the point of a smooth running society is to make the most out of everybody that's there every member that's there 